Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kim, and I'll be your MC in the theater. Uh, the session, National Dance Funding in a New Presidential Administration, is here. Um, as a friendly reminder, you are on camera. Sessions are filmed and photographed for archival purposes. If you wish not to be captured, the no photography zone is the back row of the theater. Um, the session will consider the role of local funders and how public and private funding for the arts is changing one year into a new presidential administration. Please join me in welcoming our wonderful panelists. Thank you. I'm Eddie Tor. Uh, I just want to make sure the audio on this is working okay. Good? Okay, great. Uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate Lane and Alejandra and the entire team. This is amazing. This is incredible turnout and incredible energy, and I'm really, really privileged to get to be a part of it. So thank you to all of you. Um, I'm Eddie Torres. I'm president and CEO of Grant Makers in the Arts, and um, I am privileged to be joined by Kerry McCarthy, director of Thriving Communities, Arts and Historic Preservation at the New York Community Trust. Tom Finkelpearl, Commissioner of Cultural Affairs for New York City. <laughs> Gina Paik uh, from the Nonprofit Finance Fund. <laughs> Margaret Morton, Director of Creativity and Free Expression at the Ford Foundation. <laughs> Susan Fader, Program Officer at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And so, um, you know, we're going to have a conversation uh, that is framed in terms of this presidential administration, but I want to be very explicit right from the start that um, we'd like this framing to be broader than that. You know, one, I, I don't want the frame to just hinge upon the president, nor do I want it to just hinge upon this administration. The fact of the matter is that we are a nation that has a president that received the, the uh, lower number of votes than um, his opponent. Um, and the reason we have that is because of structures. And so I want to frame this conversation in terms of structures in instead of it being about people. And this is a larger consideration when we consider, one, the history of our country, but two, whenever we do our work, when we think about structures um, and the difference between structural discrimination and just being a bigot, you know? So um, the, the, the issue being that our, what we do to address structures is actually very different and much bigger than not being a bigot. Um, and so the reason the person who actually got the smaller number of votes is in fact our president is because of the electoral college, which is a structure. It was a structure meant to, uh, uh, that, that's been maintained largely to make sure that uh, uh, initially states that had smaller numbers of people but which wanted to maintain slavery were accommodated. Um, and this actually has worked out beautifully in terms of this administration. He uh, did not get this larger number of votes, but he got the, the endorsement of the grand, what's it, the grand wizard, grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan? Um, but that wasn't because he got the greater number of votes. It was because of a structure that was established and maintained. And uh, when we think about support for the arts, likewise support for anything, philanthropy and public support are structures. Um, and when we consider the extent to which they've been established or maintained to discriminate against people, we also have the opportunity to address those structures so that they can uh, uh, end patterns of discrimination. And so that's what I'd like to be able to talk about. Now, I, I consider at this moment, and I can't imagine I'm going to have a hard time convincing anybody here, creative self-expression to be of, of primal importance right now. Um, the amount of money that's going to go into building a border wall, that's our money, um, there's no security expert who maintains that's actually important. It's largely a symbolic act. It's a symbol of hate, right? Um, when a Nazi killed a protester, this did not anger our president, but the cast of Hamilton does anger our, our president. Jay-Z ang angers our president. An athlete taking a knee during a song angers this president. And um, when we consider a, a federal budget proposal that eliminates 
our ability to express ourselves creatively, that shows us how important creative self-expression is during this moment and the importance of structures in terms of dressing this moment. So, I wanted to be able to frame this conversation in those regards. So, get off my soapbox for a second. Um, in terms of um, when we began having this conversation, Gina, you made, a, you made a point that I think is actually really foundational. That I, I, would you like to talk about that? Sure. Um, you know, as we talk about this administration, we talk about equity, um, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot, so I work at Nonprofit Finance Fund, and we work on capacity building issues around finance with organizations, and we're often playing this intermediary role between grant makers and nonprofits, and we think a lot about, you know, how do we move structures, how do we move systems, how do we make some real changes um, beyond the, the, you know, individual organizations, which, of course, you know, we want to help, but we really want to be able to move the whole sector. And so, you know, I was saying, you know, we work in this place where we talk about finance, but actually we run up against equity and diversity issues all the time. And it really comes down to, like even in, in a world of numbers and in a language of numbers, it comes down to building trust and respect with the people, with you know, the organizations, with everybody that we're working with. Um, but then in trying to build that trust and respect, <coughs> language becomes a real sticking point um, in the work that we do and we struggle with it, you know, because we, um, and I think all of us, we struggle with it. We're afraid of offending each other. We're afraid of sometimes retaliation, you know, on the part of um, organizations. If there's a little bit of, you know, there's something in the past that you're not, you know, you're, you're worried about. Um, and so I, I, I said that, um, you know, the, the way that we move forward as a sector and as, as a field is to build that trust and we really can only do that by admitting and acknowledging and naming the struggle around language and that we all acknowledge that we're in this together and that um, we really want to um, speak honestly with each other. So it's never going to be perfect, but that we need to kind of establish that. And, and I wanted to start with that kind of a, a point just because, you know, whenever we talk about these issues, they are sensitive issues. And, you know, none of us is absent an emotional life. Um, you know, two points I wanted to start with is, you know, we, we talk about issues of equity. Um, you know, uh, from my position at Grant Makers in the Arts, we regard equity as uh, inherently different than diversity or inclusion. We think diversity and inclusion are good things, but we think equity is basically about investing in uh, organizations that are by, for, and about the people that uh, we want to serve. So whether they're culturally explicit organizations or disability arts organizations, etc., And that um, diversity is largely an HR intervention, not a bad thing at all, but different than equity. That equity is about communities uh, specifically. Um, the other point I actually wanted to make is, you know, with some frequency we're going to talk about um, communities of color or Asian, Latinx, uh, African, Arab, Native American communities. And I'll go back and forth in terms of nomenclature between using the term people of color or Alana. Um, and I only point this out because I don't think any nomenclature is perfect. And so um, if I go back and forth, I'm offending half the people at any given moment as opposed to all the people at uh, any given moment. So. Um, Likewise, with disability, I go back and forth between disability first language and people first language. Um, and please understand that I am trying to, uh, I'm trying to get it right. I'm speaking from the perspective of a cisgendered male, middle-aged and middle class, um, and uh, recognizing that I'm in a position of privilege. Um, so I wanted to start off talking about this issue of this administration our values and the extent to which your, the values that are being manifested are actually long-standing values. Um, uh, it's, it seems to me that so many of, the, uh, for us, of the work that we've been doing is of a piece with the work we've been doing all along. Um, Margaret, you made this point early on when we began talking about it. Would you, would you talk about Ford's work in this regard? Sure, um, Margaret Morton with the Ford Foundation. Um, uh, for us, um, we had, at the time of the election, um, we had, you know, firmly committed to addressing inequality, um, you know, worldwide. Um, we recognized it was really the defining challenge of our time. 
um, the election really emboldened us and um, just reaffirmed um, the need for our work. Uh, part of our evaluation when we were you know, looking at strategy was looking at the drivers of inequality. And um, uh, there are many drivers of inequality. Um, we identified five, um, including the fact that um, there, was, there has been um, very deep discrimination against racial caste and ethnic minorities and women um, for, for centuries. Um, the fact that um, economic rules and regulations um, really privilege um, the wealth classes. Uh, and the idea that narratives, um, entrenched cultural narratives, um, help to continue to drive inequality against um, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, um, and women. Um, and and others who are you know disabled people um, and po people who live in poverty. Um, so this really was affirming for us. Um, a couple of things we did um, following the election, um, following our strategy, was to um, to lift up artists. We know that artists have been in the forefront um, of making change of um, social movements. We um, reaffirmed a residency program that our president, Darren Walker, had created during our strategy, which was Art of Change Fellowships. And we chose nearly 30 artists um, who are working across disciplines in this area to really elevate their voices at a time when we knew that um, women, people of color, and immigrants were really being vilified um, by, our, by, our, by, by the highest level of government. So um, people like Post Commodity, which is a multidisciplinary public art um, collective, Native Americans, um, doing really deep work, Camille Brown, Ping Chong. Um, again, uh, we were really lifting up artist voices. That was one thing. Um, another, uh, another thing that we did in, in collaboration with, with Tom Finkelpearl and Culture, Department of Cultural Affairs wa was to help um, organizations um, dealing with the aftermath, wanting to be brave, um, but, but wanting to be careful about how they work on political ideas and content. And we held a, um, a convening. Um, and we highlighted both Hank Willis Thomas and Fabiana Rodriguez, um, along with lawyers and nonprofit um, legal advisors to um, help, help um, organizations and artists really strategize about how they um, addressed um, and you know, contested and um, about you know, rights and, um, and liberties and freedoms and freedom of expression. Um, a third thing was a surge fund um, that my colleagues did across the board um, to fund civic engagement projects um, uh, across the country, um, recognizing the need for um, funding to be nimble um, and direct for people working um, to counter, um, to counter um, government. Anton? Yes, hi. Um, so actually I want to just uh, follow up in a way on what Margaret was saying. So we've actually had a really good partnership with, I think with the private sector, especially the uh, foundations. There's a lot of stuff we can talk about as we go on in that relation, but our sort of project, I guess, in terms of trying to understand what we do and how we could do it better and how we could do it in a more equitable way, didn't start with the election. It started, I think, with folks in the city talking to us and saying, you have to look in the mirror more closely and you have to do a cultural plan. So we did eventually uh, agree to do this. We had 400 meetings with 25,000 people. I don't have to tell Eddie who was at probably 200 of them. I was probably at 100 of those meetings. And a lot of stuff sort of came up and bubbled to the surface in relationship to equity. Um, there was a very well organized and, and I thought amazing uh, group of folks in the disability arts community who did a great job, who got results, who have we have a staff member whose focus is on that now. We're gonna roll out some funding related to that now. We have, we also launched at the Ford Foundation several years back, uh, what was originally called a diversity plan, which now we call diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I do think, you know, diversity, if you talk about diversity, it is a little bit of a, an HR term, but I also have challenged audiences, and I'll do it again, to tell me an organization you visited that has a very diverse staff 
that doesn't have a very diverse audience and program. So I do think just that HR thing is a great start, and it's an amazing thing to see very diverse organizations. We can get in further to that later. But I, I think then the election happened. We're in the midst of this um, uh, cultural plan, thinking deeply about how to connect with different communities, et cetera, listening. Uh, one of the things that Eddie said was we had a lot of time in our um, a role at cultural affairs, sort of like this, to talk to audiences, but the cultural plan was a really good chance to listen to audiences, to listen to the city. Uh, in any case, and I think what Margaret was referring to also was then a session that said, in the light of the election, you have to be careful and you have to do stuff that is legal. As a nonprofit organization in America, you cannot endorse a political candidate. It's one of those things that is possibly the death sentence for your organization's uh, nonprofit status if you get uh, involved in electoral politics. But that scares people off from getting involved in issues. So one of the things that was really important at that session at Ford, and I think we had, I don't know, 70 or 80 cultural organizations present, was to talk about the fact that you can be very actively involved in issues. And I'm just gonna say one more thing which relates to vocabulary and what people say or should say or can say or can't say. And it relates to immigration and the word sanctuary. So I was on a panel recently in which uh, there was this discussion about that word. Should cultural organizations declare themselves sanctuary? Should cities, et cetera? And our opinion, the city's opinion is, that would be great if you want to do it as a cultural organization. The city has not declared itself a sanctuary city. And there are reasons for that. We are listed as a sanctuary city. If you look up sanctuary cities on Wikipedia, New York is front and center as a sanctuary city. <laughs> what that means is that we, meaning not me, but the mayor and the police department have made the uh, decision that unless legally sort of required to do so, local police will not essentially act as immigration officers in coordinating with ICE. That's sort of the technical definition of a sanctuary city. The question is, if you call yourself a sanctuary city, do people get a sense that you can therefore live in that city safely? And the answer is no. We're, we live in the United States of America. And the same question goes for a cultural institution. If, you, if Gina Gibney were to uh, declare itself a sanctuary, would that mean that people would think that if you ran over to Gina Gibney, ICE wouldn't run in at the door after you? So this is a complicated question a question of vocabulary, but I just wanted to, to say that we've been thinking carefully about that, so much more to say, but I will leave it at that. And Kerry, would you talk about this in terms of you know, your long-standing values, even you know, prior to, to this you know, presidential administration? Sure, um, the New York Community Trust has been around since 1924, and what we do is connect generous New Yorkers with the nonprofits doing the excellent work on the ground. Uh, we, are, we are committed to ensuring that there are healthy individuals, promising futures for all New Yorkers, and that New York is actually a thriving community. So we've been doing that for a long time, which means that for a long time, we've been <coughs> making grants to, um, for, for immigrants' rights. We, found, we created the Fund for New Citizens, which is a coalition of philanthropy across the city that has been for nearly 30 years. Uh, making New York a safe place for, for new immigrants. So um, after the election, we decided to double down on our values uh, with a rapid response fund we created called the Liberty Fund. We brought together a handful of foundations that included the Jerome L. Green Foundation and the New York Foundation to work with us. And um, I think it was, right, the election was in November. By the end of January, beginning of February, the following February, we had gotten out a million dollars in um, grants to groups that were gonna do things like be sure that there were Know Your Rights workshops available for um, organizers and advocates. Uh, we were making grants to protect, uh, to create hate-free zones and to protect populations that we thought were particularly vulnerable. Um, like the Muslim community, uh, the LGBTQ community. I want to give a shout out to Arthur and Charles who were here, uh, here earlier this morning from the Bronx Academy of Arts and Dance, which basically acts as the only LGBTQ community center in the Bronx. So we were trying to do things um, to, shore up, to shore up these nonprofits doing excellent work. Fantastic. And Gina, can you talk about the work that, that you guys do? 
Um, sure. Um, so, at you know, nonprofit finance fund, um, you know, when related to the administration, you know, in some ways, um, issues of equity for us has always been about issues of equitable access to resources and funding and funds and and technical know-how around financial planning. And this was something that we certainly were thinking a lot about before the administration and we were thinking about, um, you know, even in the funding world, there are the haves and the have-nots. And how do we balance that to some degree in our own position as, as an intermediary and as a capacity builder? Um, and, you know, since the administration, but I mean really before then, I think one of the things that um, we observed is that organizations you know, of color or organizations dealing with specific um, communities that are sort of outside the mainstream perhaps had less access to those resources. And so we've been thinking a lot about, you know, how do we sort of democratize what we know and what we do to try to be out there more in um, the sector and just kind of provide more of that information outwardly. Um, but the other thing we're doing is talking a lot to every organization and funders, and I'm really pleased to say that we have some of our funders here on the panel, so they certainly know this, um, and talking to nonprofits about um, really looking at their own expenses, because in some ways, one of the things that we're finding, when you don't have access to money as an organization, then you start under-reporting what you actually need to run. And so, you know, and I, I hear a lot of um, murmurs, <laughs> right? So, and actually, one of the things that we learned is that in the dance community, this is actually much stronger than in, uh, sect in others, you know, in other organizations across the sector that um, kind of as a whole, dance organizations under-report what they really need. And this starts with staffing. I mean, there's a lot of volunteer time. There's a lot of unpaid, underpaid staff and leaders of nonprofit arts organizations, and not just the startup organizations. These are long-standing organizations that have been around for decades, and frankly, are the pillars of their communities and in their neighborhoods. So, you know, one of our um, our big messages, and one of the things that we would really like to push, particularly in grassroots organizations, but really um, for organizations across the sector, is kind of know your costs, know what it is that you need. To, uh, to do the work that you're doing to really thrive artistically um, and to reach out and be in the community and you know, know those costs even if you're not getting them funded because it's the only way, it's the first step in being able to advocate for those costs and then to be able to manage to them to some degree and work towards a target. And Susan, could you talk about Andrew W. Mellon, and specifically in terms of your long-standing values and how, you know, they're, uh, how they've been manifested thus far? Thank you. Um, yeah, I prefer to think about the current administration as little as possible and to <laughs> take the longer view. Um, and uh, uh, our, our mission, which was articulated for the first time in 2014 in the maturity of the Obama administration, was that we endeavor to promote, strengthen, and where necessary, defend the role of the arts and humanities. Um, to human flourishing and to the well-being of diverse and democratic societies. So that gives us enormous amount of freedom to articulate how to implement that vision. Um, and we've done so in a variety of ways. Um, but I would think even more important than the administration to my thinking has been uh, the in inexorable change in demographics that this country is going through, uh, as articulated wonderfully um, uh, by Manuel Pastor at USC, the sociologist, who has spoken at various of the kinds of conferences we attend, I think even GIA or TCG, um, and uh, Holly Sidford's groundbreaking work in fusing arts, culture, and social change. So for us, it's meant a move um, to broaden our um, grant-making portfolio to embrace Alana organizations much more actively than we have historically but this predates the administration, and then to not to forget our legacy organizations, but to work with them differently. Uh, and bringing this to dance specifically, I think about the National Dance Project, where we have been in existence for 20 years, and Mellon, uh, with the Duke Foundation, has supported it through that time. What can we do about um, broadening the way the panelists think about eligible companies? Uh, can we broaden the panelists? Can we broaden the location of the panel sessions? Can we bring advisors into the room that haven't been there? And that extends not only to organizations of color, but to disabled organizations. And can we constantly educate us to do the work we've done better? 
Um, uh, specific to this past year, um, there's certainly, Tom spoke about the fact that we cannot lobby directly, but we can educate. And we made a series of grants in 2017 to enable that to happen. One was to AFTA. Um, you've heard you know, the fantastic work that Bob is doing and his team. Um, others to uh, the National Humanities Council, the Association of Art Museums, um, uh, NPR, PBS, so that the work about the role of the arts and humanities in a diverse and democratic society can become manifest. I believe that the NEA survived this past year uh, not only because of the advocacy that was done in 2017, but going back to Dana Joya, who articulated that there needed to be grants in every single congressional district in the country, meant that there was bipartisan support because, as Bob said earlier, it occurred on the local level. So as a national funder, we have a responsibility to look at that vast portfolio that we can't fund as broadly as, um, as the NEA can. Uh, so we have tried to uh, create certain programs that have national impact, that can effectuate systemic change, uh, but that can also rely on local partners. Um, so uh, one of those, um, Gina referred to, uh, our work with NFF is our comprehensive organizational health initiative. Um, that has selected uh, cohorts of underrepresented um, organizations that pull their weight um, through resilience, through sweat equity, through in-kind support, um, uh, well beyond what their budgets represent, and Gina referenced this as well. Um, uh, so we have worked with the uh, National Performance, Performance Network, Visual Arts Network, largely with organizations that are either rural, organizations of color, or community serving. More recently, we're working with the International Association of Blacks in Dance. Um, and that has been uh, hugely educative, I think, both to NFF and to Mellon. Uh, Gina referenced the um, under-reporting uh, of budget, but I think it's not only the under-reporting, but it's the fear of what the response will be if you're honest about that reporting. And I think that funders have a responsibility to pay attention to those numbers, to encourage, to ask the questions, and to build the trust. And I think that that will be as important uh, work that we do uh, with IABD as anything that we will give in recovery capital or change capital. Fantastic. So I wanted to, to pivot for a moment. I mean, you've already all all begun to touch upon the work that you've been doing in response to this administration. And you know, you've talked about the importance of artists, the importance of advocacy, and the importance of, you know, thoughtful capitalization in response to, you know, forthright financial reporting. I just wanted to make sure that, that we got to cover, you know, what it is that you guys are doing in response to specifically to this moment, you know, over the course of the past year. Um, Margaret? Sure, thank you. Um, at the Ford Foundation, the arts live um, alongside documentary filmmaking and investigative journalism. And um, I would note that, uh, it, that investigative journalism has become all the more urgent, um, uh, particularly for philanthropy um, to, to focus on, to help strengthen or to help find different alternatives and innovative alternatives to, to real, true um, truth and, and, and reporting. So, um, so we, that is, that's an area where we're really trying to focus and think um, differently and strategically about how we work um, not only um, with our own portfolio but collaboratively with other foundations which we which we are doing alongside the Knight Foundation for example and OSF um, Upcoming um, next week. We are having a, a convening on the 50th anniversary of the Kerner uh, Commission which looked at um, sort of racial equity and how um, how, how race was depicted um, by the media at the time which um, helped to drive um, you know drive the conditions um, that we saw 50 years ago as an example. Um, I also want to note that um, foundation-wide civic engagement, um, civic engagement in government is, a, is one of the seven areas of work, um, but that has become a priority um, for the entire foundation and we are you know, working collaboratively um, on certain specific states, including Texas and Minnesota, to really help build um, progressive infrastructure um, to find 
to find ways to really kind of support innovative practices there. Um, a third area um, that has become all the more urgent is our work in gender, race, and ethnic justice. Um, because we had been working in that area um, when the election happened and when this, <clears throat> um, this reckoning happened because of, of you know, the leader of this country, um, our, our colleagues were able to, who had been supporting places like the National Women's Law Center, the Domestic Workers Alliance, um, and Rock USA, they were, they were able, those organizations were ready once Me Too, um, you know, you know, happened, they were ready to be able to support them in creating a network for pro bono attorneys, for example, who um, who are working with the Me Too campaign. So, um, those were just a couple of areas where I, I would say we had been working, which have become even greater priorities. That's great, and it's it's really fantastic to hear that example specifically because you know for so long you've been funding this not necessarily in anticipation of the Me Too moment, but when the Me Too moment happened, you were able to, to you know, uh, leverage that infrastructure building that you've been doing for all this time. Um, Tom, you know, obviously over the course of this year, you've had you know, the cultural plan and the work around monuments, et cetera, and um, talk about time. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, a lot of the response to what's going on in Washington isn't happening at the Department of Cultural Affairs, right? That's sort of a citywide thing. There are different parts of government, you know, for example, public housing or, you know, um, all these other different parts of government that, that are responding. But I would say at some level that the Monuments Commission, so, I mean, I don't know if people in the room probably know this, so that we had a Monuments Commission established to try to figure out what to do, in a sense, in the wake of what happened in Charlottesville and the, discussion around monuments. And, and I don't want to go into that in too great depth, but it is in some way, I, maybe the thing that, that our agency's done that's been in most in relationship to national politics. Because what happened there and the way that the administration in Washington handled it, as you said, was so sort of egregiously um, off the charts <clears throat> that it created a bigger public controversy around stuff that had already been controversial for a long period of time. And to just summarize what happened in the Monuments Commission, the biggest um, uh, sort of takeaway was this idea of being additive instead of subtractive, although there will be some subtraction. The idea that in other cities, the whole question, I was just in New Orleans actually yesterday, and there are several points in you go, when you look at these pedestals are empty, and Robert E. Lee is not there anymore, and that is a very curative moment to look up and see that not there. <clears throat> but in New York, the idea is to say what is missing from our public, <coughs> from our public squares, from our public monuments, and say we're going to spend $10 million commissioning new art to add to what is there. It's a very complicated set of questions. There's some very obvious uh, issues around gender. Most of the people on pedestals are, you know, able-bodied white men, right? That's pretty much it. Um, and so what about everybody else? Uh, and so where, why do we begin to add? What is our legacy, this generation's legacy gonna be in terms of adding? And then you have to ask the whole question of what is a monument, et cetera, what is a monument today? Um, but I just, you know, our, one of the things I always like to, to ponder in a room like this, so there's art politics, and there is an important question about what's gonna happen to the NEA and the NEH, but what's gonna happen to the EPA is very important to everybody in this room as well. What's going to happen to funding for transportation? What's going to happen to funding for uh, abortion, uh, for uh, Planned Parenthood? Those are fundamental questions because we're human beings living in America today. And I don't, don't want to get, you know, I don't think it's being sidetracked because it's part of the picture what's going to happen to the arts. But it's part of a big picture that is a big political picture. Yeah, you know, um, in the work that we've been doing um, with organizations, um, you know, through the Mellon Foundation, we've been working with a lot of um, organizations in rural communities um, or, you know, other um, 
other communities that are just sort of disenfranchised, or, you know, again, outside of the mainstream. Um, and as arts organizations, one of the things that were, we were really struck by was uh, this kind of hidden role of these arts organizations as um, almost like community centers in their, in their areas, because they're kind of, you know, they kind of represent um, the voice of, of the folks that um, are really, maybe, you know, their needs are not being met. And so even though they may be running a dance organization or an arts education organization, that they're really there to provide um, sometimes basic services to you know, folks living in the community. And, and this kind of goes unrecognized. And, you know, sort of by everybody in some ways, but it also goes unfunded, <laughs> right? And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a, I mean, we were just struck by that. And um, again, it just it reinforces how important it is for um, organizations and you know, and all of us and funders and you know, everybody to just kind of recognize what it is that we do, what it is that we need to continue to do what we do. Because once gentrification happens in some of these areas, and those organizations no longer are able to just afford the rent, then it's not just you know the art. Not I'm not saying it's just, but it's not like. It is not simply the art, but it is so many other things connected to the well-being of that community. Now, I was recently with a group of uh, funders who weren't largely arts and culture funders. They were environment and labor funders. And um, the way I was able to convince them of the primacy of supporting arts and culture was actually through discussion of rural communities and the role that culture plays in rural communities. And then was able to make the analysis of rural and uh, Um, Susan, you've already begun to speak about this, so I don't want you to necessarily delay very much, but I want to make sure that we are able to talk about the work that you've been doing in response to, to this long term program. Um, you mean uh, rural specifically? Uh, rural, but also just organizations of color, likewise. Yeah, uh, well, I think I did um, jump the gun a bit with the uh, work we're doing in the comprehensive organizational health. But um, we've also um, taken it upon ourselves to support um, equity training in arts organizations. And uh, we've partnered with Carmen Morgan uh, to create an arts equity program that initially started to serve um, uh, legacy theaters that wanted to improve their work, but realized very quickly that the um, Organizations of color also needed this kind of um, support to improve their um, place in society um, re relative to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the Intercultural Leadership Institute, um, Arts and Incarceration, which uh, hasn't come up um, in this conversation yet, but um, our grant, uh, our support in this area, which was actually led by our higher education colleagues that are very deep in curriculum development, but we made a grant to the Cachette Dance Organization in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which has been working with incarcerated youth and recently released uh, youth for 20 years. And um, our grant, as we attempt to systematize, is to help them nationalize uh, this work. So this is um, deeply important work that has a 0% recidivism rate led by a dance company. And uh, I was able to introduce them to Carnegie Hall, which um, White Legacy Institution has been deeply involved in prison reform and has, uh, over the last two years, uh, brought uh, people from around the country together in their Create Justice initiative. And uh, I think this is equally important. Do we, how the legacy organizations that have the uh, bandwidth to think more equitably in the work they're doing, how do they serve their communities as well? And also when you speak about, you know, arts uh, interventions actually leading to a 0% recidivism rate. I mean, your, your average rate of recidivism uh, post-incarceration is 80%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that means basically incarceration fails most of the time. Um, when, when the arts succeed all of the time, I mean, that, that's a, a huge endorsement. <laughs> Gary, did you want to uh, say anything about like the cultural agenda fund and things like sure. that? Yeah, um, I think at the trust we really think of ourselves as uh, being engaged in responsive philanthropy, and so we made the grants we talked about earlier. But four years ago, um, when uh, we got a new mayor, um, 
or four and a half years ago, um, we started looking at the sea of arts advocacy in New York City and we're looking at uh, post-recession the loss of the citywide and statewide arts advocacy organizations. They had both closed and gone out of business. So what, what did that mean with a new mayor? Um, how, was the, how was the arts community going to respond to this moment when these sort of linchpin organizations had, um, two of the linchpin organizations had closed? So we created the Cultural Agenda Fund. Um, again, we, it was, which is a funder collaborative. Uh, the Lambent Foundation came in as an initial uh, lead with us and it's now had you know, eight or nine different funders involved. I'm, not going to name them, but I love them all. They're fantastic, uh, and you can you can find out who they are on our website. But anyway, Cultural Agenda Fund was really set up to focus on uh, arts advocacy, uh, looking at cultural policy, and and building. Uh, cultural equity. And um, so over four years, we commissioned research that became foundational for the city's cultural plan. Uh, we helped seed a whole uh, a, a network of arts advocates throughout the city. A lot of those groups uh, ended up creating papers that, again, became elements, key elements in the cultural plan, but also which I think is great, is they became um, key elements in the people's cultural plan. So, so that was pretty fantastic. Um, but with that work we did around um, advocacy, we, we tried to build intentionally this network of advocates and we did a whole training program. Uh, one of the key planks in that was around understanding race and, and trying to advocate for and be, you know, uh, is around racial justice. So we brought Race Forward in to an, do a, a, a training for folks. What we learned from that was that a one day, one off training around racial equity does not mean you're good, you got it, let's go. Um, so we ha instead, we, we took from that and we invested significantly in um, Race Forward. We brought them in, we, we uh, modeled what was happening in the city of Seattle and how the city government is actually fighting for equity for all of, the, all of the residents in its city. Every city agency is doing this. They believe in equity at every level of government. Um, so what we said, well, what does that look like in a, in a sort of in a private sector approach? So we contracted with Race Forward. They've been running uh, racial justice trainings. It's an 18-month program. 60 arts and cultural organizations in New York City are participating in it, including um, Givney, uh, Dance NYC, Mark Morris Dance Center, uh, Kumbe, and there are there the. Uh, Brooklyn Arts Exchange, there are a number of dance organizations in it, as well as the Whitney, Carnegie Hall, some of these older, larger institutions, and smaller um, culturally specific institutions like the Asian American Arts Alliance are all coming together. Um, and it's been um, pretty <coughs> exciting work, I would say. I think it's uh, going to be very important for us to have uh, a network of folks who are fighting for racial justice in this city and in, in the arts sector, which has um, a, a long way to go, I would say. So, you know, I want to wrap up with, you know, asking you guys what you would cite as kind of a call to action in terms of, you know, the folks here um, and, and specifically in terms of engaging all of us. Um, Margaret, you had some thoughts around this. Sure, um, very simply, uh, I started my career um, as a young attorney on, um, on Capitol Hill in 1986, and um, uh, probably one of the first experiences that I had was um, sexual harassment, and it, it, was, um, it involved a congressman. Um, and so it, it has been sobering um, for me to sort of watch this reckoning happen, and I, and then later I did lots of work around um, equal employment policy. I helped lead um, that work, um, and you know, at the the state court system. So it was very sobering to me to see what's happening. One of the things I realize is that um, the arts, in particular, media, in particular, where um, people are not hired in a formal way, where they become employees of the of the institution, they are hired as consultants, um, very often, or contractors. That you know, you lose the ability to create create reporting systems and policies. 
um, it shouldn't be the case. So I would just um, call out to everyone because you're all involved in the arts. Um, we are in a house where I know um, the leader is, is very sensitive to these issues and is knowledgeable and um, about these issues. It's, it's, part of, um, it's part of her work, quite frankly. But um, you know, if, if I can say do something simple when you go to the place that you work or that you work with or that you work for, make sure they have, ask do they have a policy on, ha on sexual harassment? Um, is, there, is there a way for you to file a claim? Is that posted? Um, you know, people should know that there are several different entities that you can go and actually file a claim in addition to going to your employer. There's the New York City Human Rights Commission, there's the State Commission, there's the EEOC, which is the Federal Commission. Um, but go to your workplace and ask, do they have a policy? Is it clear? And is there a way to file a claim? Not simply a policy, but can they file a claim involving an employer, whether it's an external way to file a claim or an internal way. Um, and just start to ask. Um, I am I'm heartened to see that the city council is moving on this front, um, that the new leader of the city council is moving, moving on this front to really create um, a system for, um, for filing complaints, even though it hasn't passed. But there's, there's something for you to do in the interim, and that's um, ask where you work. Tom, call to action. Um, I think it, you know, there are very, so many things to say, but just to follow up on what Margaret was saying, <clears throat> I'm sort of just, uh, just continually appalled that when you open the paper, so many of the groups that you see where sexual harassment has been endemic are arts groups. It's just heartbreaking, right? It, and uh, dance has been pretty bad, right? So anyway, I just wanted to say that we, um, we do these things to open office hours with the commissioner. It's something that was started in the cultural plan, which is just a way to, we, we start by, if there's an issue, and we <clears throat> you know, get up there and talk, set the issue, and then just listen, it's a two hour thing. So it's like 15 minutes of us talking to the, and then for, uh, hour 45 minutes. So the next one is gonna be about Me Too and about the arts, and, and we haven't set the exact date yet, but if you look at our website, we do wanna have an open discussion about that. It's going to be uh, with, um, Folks who are human, uh, are employment lawyers, et cetera, in the room. It's going to be an environment in which people are going to be able to talk, hopefully, safely and, and not with repercussions, et cetera. So that will be our next open office hours with the commissioner. I do think that this is a moment that we all have to acknowledge. Okay. I, I guess for me, in this national political climate that we're operating in, it, for me, I guess, Eddie, I would say you began this conversation by talking about structures, specifically you were talking about white supremacist structures that existed. So how can we begin to look at those structures as the arts community, as the dance community, and take the action we can to dismantle them? That, that's the question, and I think it, we all have to do our, our own internal work and, and then go from there, but I hope that people will jo join us in that. Gina? Uh, sorry, mine's a long one. <laughs> As you know, um, I, I have a, a threefold message. Uh, so, the first one is sort of to everybody, and um, recognizing that that we're all here because we want to change the system, we want to change the field, and that requires partnership. And partnership requires honest conversation. And honest conversation, frankly, requires some vulnerability on all of our parts as individuals to be able to sort of stay that and to move past it and to reach out to each other. So I just kind of challenge everyone to try to be vulnerable and be open with each other as because we are all trying to get to the same place. Um, the second one is for um, funders. And um, well, A, I want to shout out to Carrie and the report that the trust put out on undoing racism in the arts. I think, just read that. Every funder should read it. I think every, um, everyone should read it. I think everything that um, was recommended in there, um, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree. But um, from where I stand from NFF, I also think that um, it's really important for funders to sort of what Susan said, not penalize the ugly truth that might come out when you start talking to each other about what's needed. And sometimes what's needed is to fix something that happened 10 years ago. And it's something that um, you know, no one likes to talk about, but it happens. And you need money to just kind of recover from uh, a situation. And that money is really hard to come by. 
and so I think it's, it's important to kind of be honest about that. Um, and then the last one is for you know, dance organizations, for nonprofits, anyone. Um, really just, again, recognize what it is that you do and recognize what it costs for what it is that you do. Even the costs that you're not getting covered with money, you're getting covered somehow, even if it's through your own sweat, blood, and tears. <laughs> and that actually, frankly, is money. And so, um, I mean, I'm happy to talk with anyone who needs ideas for how to do this better, but I just want to challenge everyone to start thinking in a way that you can put more of it on paper so that you can really um, advocate for yourself. Eddie, can I just chime in here? I just wanted the report that Gina just cited, I wanted to give people the title so they, if they were interested in reading it, and I can't remember it, that's why I'm actually <laughs> looking at it on my phone, because it's really long. Um, so what are the, it's Lisa Yancey from Yancey Consulting did this, and it was co-commissioned with the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and it's called, What Are the Paradigm Shifts Necessary for the Arts Sector to Nurture More Thriving Institutions of Color? And it's actually on the um, Duke Charitable Foundation's website, if anybody wants to see it. And Susan? Um, vote. I don't think there's anything more important than we can do than vote. Um, we have appalling turnout rates in so much of this country, and that could have made the difference in so many issue, instances. And every vote counts. Um, my son was living in New Orleans last year during the presidential election. He said, I'm voting for Jill Stein. There's no way Hillary will win in Louisiana. It doesn't matter. And I said, it does matter, because the popular vote numbers come. So you began by saying that the popular vote had not gone um, the way of the leader, um, and that could have been much greater if people had turned out. Yes. Um, I would say to the extent that dance artists can tour, bring your art to red and purple states. So this is not just the province of large urban centers. The people-to-people -people connection um, uh, is, is very, very important. And finally, I'd say have the courage of your convictions. Um, in this Me Too moment, it's very, um, challenging uh, for the leaders that have to act on this. I think the most moving conversation I had this week was with a young uh, female leader of an arts organization who had had to take action. She did absolutely the right thing following the um, protocols of her organization and she's having a great deal of post-traumatic stress in this moment, you know, despite board support, despite media support. These are very difficult interventions um, with powerful people. And so I say, have the courage of your convictions. Fantastic. And you know, we've gotten a couple of uh, questions from the audience. I want to read both of them and then just give you a moment to sort of popcorn responses. Um, how can low budget dance makers survive despite changes created and proposed by the Trump administration? What actions are your organizations taking to continue making the field more equitable despite the changes? And what are some of the bright spots in public and private funding structures despite a new presidential administration? So I think we've already uh, touched upon some of these, but I just wanted to give a, a moment. I mean, there's also the issue, I mean, so many of us have been inspired by the actions of our colleagues as well. Yeah, so I have been reading that very long titled report. And one of the things I thought was quite interesting was one of the observations is that small budget organizations are often very, very good on the programming side but not on the fundraising and finance side. So I will not be quoted as giving an, a, a uh, <laughs> shout out to Nonprofit Finance Fund, but when I was at the Queens Museum, we did work with Nonprofit Finance Fund and just took a deep dive into understanding our finances in a way that is not fun. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you might have thought it was fun, but I didn't think it was fun. And that's not why I was there. And no, no, that was good. It was good. We had to do it. We had to do it because we were thinking of expanding. And that just sit down and look at the numbers and really in some great depth understand the numbers <clears throat> was helpful for the organization to figure out how to go forward. And it doesn't have to be them, but, some, but that idea that you know, putting, and where do you get the resources to hire? They're, you know, they're a nonprofit, but they're not free. So how do low income uh, organizations with low budgets get the resources to dive into the finances in the way that's gonna help? But I do think of that, and then one bright spot, I will just say. There were some uh, bright spots in the, in the uh, cultural plan. For example, we added a million extra dollars for individual artist grants. We funneled money to the smaller organizations, which, by the way, as you go up the tree, depending on, on our <clears throat> diversity survey, the bigger organizations are less diverse than the little organizations. The little organizations got more money. 
uh, in a variety of different ways and organizations in what were the um, spots on the map identified the social impact of the arts project, which was a two-year two study of New York City in terms of uh, equity, et cetera, related to social impact of the arts. Organizations based on the maps created by that study got more money this year as well. So there was a, and there was, you know, eighteen and a half million dollars of extra funding added at adoption last year. So there was extra money put into the cultural budget in, locally. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, the bright spot I was going to call out was Tom's ability to get more money. So that was great. <laughs> Um, I, I, th I was actually inspired by the previous panel with uh, Bob and Michelle, and they were the words that they talked about, <laughs> that they used were hope and joy. And it's easy to kind of get depressed about what's going on when you know you know hate crimes are up 300 percent or whatever. But um, but there, this is a moment of opportunity, and we have we as the arts community have been attacked, right? The NEA was, was proposed to be zeroed out completely and we, uh, we, are, we actually are thriving. The, the, our funding for the arts and culture is up and this seems to me to be an incredibly fertile moment in terms of artistic activity. I think the artists are doing work in response to the environment in which they operate and it's creating some really dynamic and fantastic artwork. So that's what I go back to for hope and joy in this moment. I guess I'll say something. I mean, I, you know, when I think of bright spots, I, okay, so this is my kind of twisted mind. I mean, I think, all right, um, we've seen a lot of administrations come and go. We've seen administrations change policy in many different ways. And here Trump is, and he is, wow, you know, <laughs> he is a big, you know, rock thrown into this pond. And it can, uh, there's, you know, we see so much fear and uncertainty. Um, amongst our clients and, and everyone that we work mm. with about our, you know, about funding and, you know, what's going to happen to our donations and so forth. And, you know, and I acknowledge all of that, but there's this kind of twisted part of me in the back of my mind thinking, you know, Trump is mobilizing us. He is, you know, he, we are all so united <laughs> in this moment that we should use that and we should use it to reach out to each other. And absolutely, I see a ton more partnerships. I see a ton of people and organizations reaching out to each other saying, how can we leverage our voices to work together and how can we move together? But also sometimes, you know, you may or may not save money. I don't know. You know, that, that, I'm not sure if that actually bears, um, bears out. But, but we are stronger artistically and we are stronger um, in our voice. And that to me is the bright spot. I believe in I believe in the power of the art to do that. Um, I'm going to turn it back to money. Um, GIA has um, been talking about capitalization very actively since 2010, and I think funders are learning from this and changing their practices. Um, so that, as hard as it may have been for you, Tom, at Queen's Museum, I think that exercise gave you uh, the financial literacy to tell your story. And when you tell your story, then you learn how to ask. And when you learn how to ask, um, those of us gate gatekeepers at this table can respond um, more fairly, more equitably, and um, become better funders in the process. Um, you, you, you don't get this money if you don't ask. And I think that funders are learning that capitalization is more important than underfunded project support and that capitalization includes general operations as well as um, artistic programming. And I think this is a very bright spot that has nothing to do with the administration. <laughs> and, you know, I just want to... to I'm sorry, Margaret? Um, I, I would just very briefly, um, you know, we, we have a limited funding budget um, at the Ford Foundation. I, I know that um, that seems um, hard to believe, um, but <laughs> but we but we really try to collaborate um, across the foundation, and we try to be very strategic about how we can support best um, with the legacy of our um, of our institution. And cultural criticism um, is is one area that we have just started to explore um, because we do want to elevate the voices of. Um, of artists who have been marginalized but are doing exceptional work. 
And um, that is an area that we will begin focusing on um, very strategically in the coming year, um, led by my colleague Chi Wei Yang and Elizabeth Mendez Berry um, at um, Nathan Cummings Foundation. And I just want to, to loop back around for, in conclusion from this panel to the panel prior. You know, um, I had the privilege of working with uh, Tom on the cultural plan and thanks to the great work of the Cultural Agenda Fund, <laughs> engaging so many of the folks in this room and the rest of the place. Um, as cultural advocates and getting to hear from all of you and getting to learn from all of you and getting to respond to all of you. So, you know, if there's one thing I would really try to impress upon people is that advocacy does matter, advocacy does work, and it has to be ongoing all the time. And I just wanted to say thank you to Lane and to Alejandra for, for creating this space for all of us, and thank you for your leadership. Gina, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. Thanks. Thank